Hi everyone, welcome to another author chat. With me tonight is Alex Knight, uh, author of many books, uh, most recently Paragon of Blood, which he has co-written with Luke Chimilenko. I think I pronounced that name correctly. Alex, why don't you tell us about yourself and some of your some of your books? Uh, howdy, everybody. Um, I'm actually, I would say, longtime friends with Michael, uh, having met. God, what was it? 2018 now in, in London? 2017? 2017? That was before that, wasn't it? Yeah, 2017, I, I guess. Yeah, summer 20. Anyway. One, uh, one, night in, in, one night in a pub. There you go. Yeah, literally one night in a pub. It was it was like something out of a story. Um, yeah. The stereotypical start to a story is a bit what it felt like. But, it was like uh, a tavern where you get your quest. Everyone was there. <laughs> yeah. and, and it was an appropriately like uh, authentically themed tavern. A lot of dark wood, low lights. I feel like there was probably some smoke floating around somewhere. But uh, no, I met Michael in uh, 2017 in London. And at the time, I was a freelance writer. And uh, since then, pivoted into full-time author and uh, had the pleasure of writing some books with his wonderful, wonderful publishing company, Portal Books, who uh, I credit with giving me my start into the publishing industry. And I've written, what, uh, four, four books with them now, as well as uh, two more with Audible UK and one with uh, Luke Chimlenko, most recently Paragon of Blood. And uh, that's pretty much what I do. There's, there's a lot that goes into the author career, but my goal is to be at the keyboard as much as possible. Yeah, I, I mean, you you have quite a good work ethic in that. I mean, you, you would you say that you write quite quite quickly, quite efficiently? Seems that way, seems that way to me looking in, but... I, you know, I, I, I'd like to think so. Uh, I was better at it for the last couple of years and it's been a rough patch for about the last eight months now. Um, but that's, that's how it goes. I think that's kind of part of coming to terms with the process is sometimes everything flows smoothly and you churn out a book in three, four months. Uh, and sometimes it takes about, you know, eight, 12 longer, maybe, uh, for the right. ones that are really sticking with you. Uh, but it's all part of the process. And I think as long as you're at that keyboard and thinking and putting words on page, you're going to at least have a product at the end of the day. Yeah, even if it feels like tree cool sometimes. <laughs> yeah. In winter. Anyone following along will probably see in my post that I'm uh, in one of those tree cool points because uh, I'm right in the middle of the book where it's like I'm up over 100,000 words in. So for most books, that's like the book done. But for us, that's like not quite even halfway yet, you know, and you're just like, getting into the getting into the mud a little bit and it's daunting and you think oh i'm not even quite halfway i've got so much to go and uh yeah but we all i you know we always get through it as you say just get your butt in the get your butt in the chair and type some words and eventually somehow it comes together i i saw your post on i think it was discord maybe um about being 100k in and kind of hitting a rough spot and my first thought was I don't know, 100K in, sounds like the book's done. I think you're there, right? Just, you know, cut it there and start the third book. <laughs> if only, uh, it, these these are getting very long. These are getting very long. Like when I started Ascendant, the idea at first was, oh, that will be shorter. Um, we'll, take them with, we'll take them to YA publishers. They want books about 90,000. So I'll go shorter. And then things happened and whatnot and it became 165,000 words <laughs> which is my which was longer than anything i'd done and uh, then unbound became 220,000 and now uh, this one the untitled book free is probably going to be a quarter of a million if not more um and this yes yeah, so yeah 100k you're like that's, a, that's quite a lot of words but it doesn't doesn't feel like it because you know you're kind of still almost revving up certain plot lines are you know still maturing and so mm -hmm. you <laughs> you haven't got that excitement necessarily of like oh we're storming ahead you're still like you're laying down the laying down the road um it's just, just how it always feels in the middle like the middle is pretty rough i think it, it's the story telling itself to you and it's not going to constrain itself to uh the image you had in your head no <laughs> oh that's not um so Having moved from your, some the sort of freelance stuff that you used to do into more of the traditional, what well, I say traditional, more of the kind of face, um, putting your face forward onto the books, your name, your face, everything. Like, is that, do you, do you, is this the right move? Do you prefer this? 
uh, is that, you know. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, if only just for at the basis of reasons, the fact that I get to write the books that I want to write. Um, mm -hmm. When you're when you're working as a freelancer, and I was a ghostwriter for a while, uh, you know, the client comes to you with the project, and so. Uh, true story, you end up writing things like uh, romance novellas focusing on roller derby. Um, or my favorite was a health and nutrition book in which Superman was the main character um, and taught you everything about nutrition, including a chapter on supplements. Um, or no, sorry, uh, suppositories, which uh, that got awkward. <laughs> but right. what? the checks cleared and that's what they wanted me to write. And I guess the book did okay. So at the end of the day... Uh, you get a finished product, but no, I'm very happy to be writing books that I want to write. And there's kind of a, a different connection that you get with the book when it's, when you're writing something that's true to yourself. Um, mm -hmm. The story kind of manifests in ways that you might not have expected. And I don't really, I'm sure that's some interaction of like your creativity and your subconscious. It's a lot more fun just to be like, yeah, it's the magic of the story. You know, it's figuring itself out. Um, I'm sure you can do a lot of scientific studies into how that all works out, but to me, it's just trust the story and kind of let it guide you. And at the end of the day, you get a book and you might learn something about yourself from it. Mm, very profound, Alex. So, I mean, is there, so is there anything you miss about the old days? Is there any, is there anything that's the, a pro of, of your, of, you know, of the freelancing system that you miss or is it all, all benefit, all gravy? You know, the, it's going to be a bit sketchy to say it this way, but at least the money was more stable in freelancing. Like it's, it's a common joke in freelance that half the work is getting the work and the other half is actually getting paid for it. And then you actually still have to do the work. Um, but you at least knew a paycheck was coming with author stuff. You know, it's a bit more up and down. You're waiting quarter to quarter to see how royalties are doing. You're talking with publishers about advances and whatnot. So that's all a bit shaky. Um, but at the end of the day, I just get to focus so much more on creativity and writing. And that's really what I got into it. And mm -hmm. I've said forever now, if I could make just above the poverty line enough to keep myself afloat and write books the rest of my life, like we're good, done deal. I'll take that and deal. Well, the, you know, this this series that you're writing with Luke seems to be reasonably reasonably lucrative. That was a fairly, you know, quite a quite a wild deal when we heard about that. I mean, that was uh, really fantastic for you, and that so that must have changed things, I guess, in in some ways. It absolutely did. And I mean, really, I have y'all to thank for it. Because uh, if you remember, Luke uh, cover blurbed Warden, uh, my first book with Portal. And uh, I guess he truly did really like that book. Because, um, you know, we developed a friendship over it like three years after Warden came out, uh, which a year later led to talking about co writing, which then led to pitching a series together that ended up getting picked up. And yeah, it has, it's been a pretty big deal. Um, it, I was a little bit nervous because it's my first time co-writing with anybody, but mm -hmm. Luke is a dream to work with. Like it, there's always concerns of like, Oh, well, are we, are we all going to do our share? Or like, is one person going to do more? And the other person's just going to like be kind of a manager. Like, how's it going to fit together seamlessly? Are you going to do something like the expanse writers where like one guy takes half the characters, the other person takes the other half. And um, will our writing styles mesh? But now Luke was absolutely wonderful to work with. And I was so amazed at how like, I put my core of the story in there and my characters and then Luke took it and worked with it and put a little twist on it and just brought it more to life. And at the end of the day, it really felt like, wow, we built this together. Um, so it was a wonderful process on top of the fact that, you know, being with Luke um, gets the book out to a lot of readers. And it, it's nice to have a book that you're never certain that something's going to do well, but it's a lot nicer when the floor that you're going to hit is, Luke Chimlenko floor, as opposed to Alex Knight floor, which is you sell six books and uh, stare at Kindle Direct Publishing's dashboard all day with no hope in the world. Um, well, yeah, it definitely gave me some runway, and it and it, it has been absolutely great all around. So I think you're underrating yourself there a little bit, Alex. But um, yeah, we 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 you know I know what you mean. Um, what with this series, then? I mean, do you guys have it all planned out? Do you have like I think it's five books. Do you have like all of them planned or was it you, you pantsing it a little bit as you go? Like, where are you? Yes, going? we do have a, an arc plan for book five we, or through the five books. We know where the series will end. Um, we have, we had book one planned out 
well. Uh, book two is, is more of a skeleton. We know where it will go and what we want to accomplish, but not necessarily the in-between bits. Um, and that's kind of by design. We like to have the big objective outline and then kind of let whatever path we end up needing to take to get there, uh, you know, run its course. Um, and that's kind of how we're approaching books three and four and eventually five is just a, we know where we're going. We know what we want to do. Uh, the path to get there might be more winding. And honestly, I like to leave that room for creativity. Um, in a way, it, it allows you to surprise yourself with the story a bit more. Um, which as an mm. author, you, you tend to, if you've plotted the whole book out ahead of time, you already know the story. Uh, and your job is not to tell it to the readers. I like to leave a little bit of, a little bit of mystique in there and let the story surprise me once in a while. So I get to, in some way, experience a little bit what the readers do of not necessarily knowing where everything's going and getting surprised by a plot twist. Yeah, I mean, it can be some of the most magic. It can be some of the most euphoric moments. Sometimes you're just trundling along and some idea just comes to you and it just seems completely right. And it is, as, it is as if you've turned the page and come across the surprise yourself. Uh, and it feels wonderful. And then you have to, then the tricky part is actually writing it. <laughs> but, for sure. For sure. And, yeah. and speaking of, I, I actually, I know you're the interviewer here, but I want to ask you a question too, because I just oh, have Yeah, go on. <laughs> flip, flip the tables. I, I, you know, we, we talk a lot on WhatsApp, um, but it's different in voice and I haven't really had a chance to ask. I wanted to ask about Ascendant because, you know, I, I, I read an early copy of it. I loved the book. Um, I still got to finish the second one. Shame on me, but I'm terrible about reading books these days. Um, I don't know if I finished a book in six, seven months now. It's, it's, it's terrible. Um, but with Ascendant, were there any moments like that that surprised you where, you know, you knew where you're going with it, but then something came up and you just kind of followed it and ended up being really good? Um, um, in terms of the plot, nothing hugely because I find I I find it very difficult to write forward without having a good grip of the plot, at least the next 50,000 words, say. And even if the even if the ending is very bullet pointy, I kind of need to know roughly where I'm going. Otherwise, I find it very hard to kind of plod along. Right, um, right. So, for, so where I was stuck a little bit with book three right now, I was midway through a certain POV, and I was I, I kind of knew what I wanted to come next. But once I kind of reached that that launch point for the next half, my brain started like yelling at me that something wasn't working. So I had to like walk, come away from it for a little bit, and then really think about it until I got the plot completely ironed out all the motivations all etc so plot stuff doesn't ever really jump out at me but usually what will happen is there'll be some small world building detail or perhaps like a little a character like a, that i wasn't like intending to be very important just the way that i decided to write them to make them a little more interesting like so the twin blades of uh, house haraway those kind of blo the brothers that speak with a kind of back and forth uh, they were not any. They were not in the plan at all. But just in that scene, it felt like I just I don't want to have some generic guardsman come to like arrest Hope. I thought I needs to be what can make this scene more interesting. Uh, well, how about these like wacky you know brothers who are like expert fighters, but they have this like back and forth with their voice and they kind of finish each other's sentences and you know um, they're called the twin the twin blades of House Highway. Just a bit cooler than just a guardsman came to arrest Hope. <laughs> um, and so. Because they were because I enjoyed them so much, I kind of fed them through the rest of that book and then I put them into Unbound as well. So stuff like that will take me by surprise a little bit. Uh, that's yeah. unexpected. Um, and I suppose I suppose Rake was not unexpected, but when I reached the point in the story in which he is introduced in Ascendant, um, again wasn't really part of the plan, but I just felt around as I was coming towards that point, I felt. I need something more here. I need, I need some, I need like a, I need like a zest of lime juice or something, you know, to like, <laughs> to, to jazz it up. It needs, it needs something here. It needs a little extra. Um, and so Rake, Rake was brought into the story and uh, I'm very glad he did come into the story because he's one of the best parts as far as I'm concerned. Um, but yeah, so plot, plot doesn't really surprise me. Sometimes characters do and sometimes world building or magic building details do and that can affect the plot but i go off and i, I think about that more carefully sure i love that when when characters that 
just need to fill a niche, come up and, and make themselves more important. And you just like, you didn't even expect it, but you had so much fun writing them or you found a little twist that made them so much more fun that they hang out. Um, Ellington and Sergeant Dawson in the Nova Online trilogy were a hundred percent the same thing you were just saying there where it's like, yeah. they just needed to be side characters and I wanted them to sound authentic. So I put a little work into writing them and I was like, huh, these guys are kind of fun. Maybe I should lean on them a bit more. And there right. you go. Yeah. They kind of, it's hard, to, right it's hard to know, right? Cause there's so many random little side characters or, you know, what they call spear carriers or flag carriers, you know, mm -hmm. depending on your terminology that come in and out of a story, but you can't make them all special. And it, it's hard to know which one. You know, sometimes it's like, well, what, should this should this person be more special? Should they not? Like, where do I want to spend the time? Um, so it, it isn't a, it isn't an easy thing to figure out. But when it when it works, it is it's good. It does and it does change things. You know, like a lot of those like those twin blades. Like they, I think they made the scenes that they weren't better, and I think they added to the story. And I just never conceived of them beforehand. You know, but it sort of right. weaves in organically, and somehow it works. Um, it's, it's, it's surprising to me that things work at the end because a lot of it isn't like super intended, you know, like you have, yeah. you have like, you have like half of it intended and the other half kind of comes out of the, comes out of the chaos somehow. It's, it's kind of, it's what I love so much about writing is every day that you're drafting new material, some days you're editing and, and heaven forbid there are days you have to edit and it's just what it is. But when you're actually drafting new material, it's kind of like stepping off of a cliff in darkness every day. And you don't necessarily know what's ahead of you. You know vaguely where you're going, which I guess in this uh, analogy would be the ground. But there, it's just, you kind of just have that blind trust to just like, I'm just trusting in my creative process and we're gonna put fingers to keyboard and see what uh, ends up on the page. It'll surprise you and it's fun. So I'll jump back into the driver's seat. I mean, feel free to take over again if you like. But uh, you were saying you've you're finding it hard to finish books lately. Like, is that has that been just a really recent thing? Because I think um, I think a lot of us hit that point at some point where we struggle to get into another stories and we struggle to finish them, and right. we we lose a little bit of the the wonder. I suppose we lose we've lost a little bit of the 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 ability to just completely disconnect and immerse because we've kind of we see how the sausage is made. Do you think? That's happened yeah. here. Yeah. It, you know, I think I've thought a lot about this because I prided myself on writing books start to finish with momentum, blasting through it. I mean, I had to when I was a, a ghostwriter. It was like you had to get the project done. Um, and I've thought a lot about this because I think it really started with um, Rise to Glory. Um, I started writing in the middle of the pandemic or right at the beginning of it. Um, and just the ambient kind of like bad vibes of the whole world really slowed that process down. That was the first book that actually took me uh, a lot longer to finish. I think the writing time was like seven or eight months on that one, which was really long for me having been at three to four uh, was my target prior to that. Um, but I also cared a lot, like a lot about that book. Um, it was my first book that I had written after the you Nova know, Online trilogy, so new world, new characters. Um, I wanted to do them justice and the combination of like wanting to put in that extra effort to really make it good with just the bad vibes of pandemic made it a very long process. Um, and at the end of the day, I was happy with it. But so I had that book, which was my first like real challenging one. And from that, I pivoted into um, while I was writing Rise to Glory, um, Audible UK had purchased the audio rights to a manuscript I had written that hadn't been released. Um, and I needed to do some rewriting on it before we released uh, the audio version we were going to do. Um, so I went from a very difficult book to rewriting an already existing manuscript, which again was kind of a weird thing. And then from yeah. that, I started writing another book for Portal, um, Nightfall. And I got a little bit into it. And because Rise to Glory and The Far Wild had pushed me so far behind deadline, I didn't have the adequate amount of time to write Nightfall. So I had to put a pause on the book, like 20,000 words in, to do Paragon of Blood with Luke. Um, and that process went totally fine. But by the time I finished it and came back to Nightfall, I think the ideas had been stewing along in my head for so long um, that it, I don't really know what it was, but they just, I had been involved with the book mentally for so long that coming back to it felt like I had already finished the book. And I just fell into this series of like, 
false starts and restarts on it. And I was making good stuff, but I just kept finding reasons that it wasn't working. And my takeaway from it is pandemic, global pandemic has made everybody's headspace not great. Um, and also momentum is important to finishing books. Like the yes. fact that I started it, had a six month interruption to write Paragon and then came back to it, like just bad process overall. So my new thing is dive into a book full on, only focus on that book for three to four months and like everything from the music I listen to, to the clothes I wear, to backgrounds on my phone and my computer and whatnot, it's all themed to the book to just keep me in that headspace and just, you know, laser focus that for like four months, get it out and keep going. That's how I fought through the, uh, the kind of false start and I don't know, very slow process that's kind of been creeping in that I do not like. Well, you know, I mean, that, I, I, you're not alone in, in that. And I would also say that sometimes when you move to being full time, it, you actually do have, you, you actually do lose some of that urgency that you might have had before. Mm -hmm. It's not necessarily a bad thing. I think, I, I mean, obviously, you, obviously, some people might just fall off a cliff of it. Like maybe they're not very, maybe they're not used to having to like sit down and like kind of structure their day precisely, but that's not the case here. But I think the fact that you have that little bit more time. You know, so that's okay. Like you can let your brain just sponge it up a little bit more. And because you're not so, the, the push isn't there, so you might not be driving out words. But I suspect what you're writing is better for it. I suspect mm -hmm. what's happening is your brain's being a little more critical. It knows it has a little bit more time to think. And you're, you know, you're not, you're not just sort of slamming out the words as, as you might have been before. And just to, you know, hit those deadlines and get those checks and whatnot. You're kind of allowing, you know, it, that, that subconscious editor is, is coming in a little more, mm -hmm. but that's a sign of growth. I think, I mean, at least that, I mean, that's, that's, that's the hope that would be the hope. Um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't overly worry too much, but I mean, absolutely. If you, if you would start a book and had that break, like that would kill it for me as well. I think momentum is so, so important, which is why when you do hit any snags, you know, I think it's the hardest thing is to kind of push through it. But if you don't, if you stop for too long, maybe, you know, stop for a day or whatever, you know, have a little break but if you don't keep coming back and even if you're beating your head off a brick wall you will just lose some you will lose something on it and it will you know it takes a long time to rev up again so yeah and, and you know i think it also ties into something you said earlier about you know once you know how the sausage gets made once you know the business of, of writing and publishing uh it, it pulls a bit of the the curtain back um which is mm -hmm. I've, I've, I learned this lesson most when I started talking to my wife a lot about the mechanics of writing and we'd watch movies or whatever. And I'd talk about like the mechanics of the story happening here. Um, and I kind of gave her without intending to a bit of a crash course in stories and character arcs and, and, and plot points and emotional beats. And now she sees stories the, a similar way that I do in terms of an analytical perspective. And that's not a bad thing, but it does allow you to enjoy the story a bit less um, not necessarily, it's, it's not just pure enjoyment, but like, instead of just being odd and like just sitting there and being whisked away by the story, you're thinking, ah, oh, the author did this because of this, or, oh, well, they had to set up this because it's going to have a payoff later. Um, it kind of takes a little bit of the magic out of it. Um, and I think part of the process of, of not letting that kill your, your own pace is letting yourself kind of fall in love with the writing again. Um, and remembering like why you got into it, the books that really inspired you. Um, and, and another one is just, you know, when you're doing ghostwriting and freelancing, you're writing for other people. Um, and it's easy to get used to that. And when you move to writing your own books, you kind of have to relearn how to write for yourself. You got to reconnect <clears throat> that like, you know, eight year old that was sitting at the kitchen table after school, just writing stories with no thoughts of, well, is this marketable to the market segment I want? Or are publishing companies looking for books like this right now? You kind of just got to get relearn how to get in touch with yourself and, and write what you're passionate about. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. It can be, I think, I, I think that it, I can, I can certainly be swept away by a story, but I think it has to work a little harder to, mm -hmm. to sweep me away. But when it does, I am so grateful for that because it is a little tougher. Um, and when I, whenever that does happen, it does, it does, uh, leave me to a bit more inspiration to, to go back 
to to the book and and work on it. So what 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 books inspired you, Alex? What, what kind of set you off on this on this um, topsy turvy career? <laughs> um, early on, I mean, I, I started off with with very you know mass market paperback fantasy. I was reading uh, Terry Pratchett, um, Raymond E. Feist, like pretty typical fantasy settings. Um, and those were great. I loved those. Um, and I think I took a bit of a divergence when I discovered Joe Abercrombie and, and Grimdark kind of hit its swing. Um, that really stole my attention for a while. Uh, but of all the books that I've read and, and connected with the most, it's got to be Michael Crichton's work, particularly Jurassic Park, The Lost World, and Congo. Um, anything that has terrifying monsters, very tense situations, and uh, generally people just running for their lives, for whatever reason, that just it really like gets my blood flowing in terms of like, wow, this is terrifying. I'd hate to be trapped in this room with a raptor and hmm, would a broom handle really work to defend myself? And how much, would, how much force would it take to smash a window? Would I be able to get out that? Um, mm -hmm. Those thoughts really uh, excite me. And I think that's what's influenced my writing the most. And I think you'll see aspects of that in a lot of it. Um, as I, I seem incapable at this point of writing a book without including uh, monsters as a significant part of it. Um, you'll see in, in Paragon of Blood, that's, that's a very big thing. Um, and the Far Wild, my uh, recent fantasy book, is very much uh, inspired by Jurassic Park. A lot of people running from things with lots of teeth. Um, and even my new book that I'm working on now is a uh, contem contemporary setting, um, kind of monster hunter thing, taking inspiration from like uh, Supernatural and, and Ash vs. Evil Dead kind of campy horror type things, but it all comes back to frightening monsters and people stuck in uncomfortable situations with them. Interesting. So I was going to ask, will we see a book, will we see a Michael Crichton style book from you? But uh, it sounds like you're working on something uh, interesting there. So maybe we'll see that in the future. Uh, I'm definitely not engineering slash science literature literate enough to, to do a proper Michael Crichton techno thriller. Uh, but take away the technology elements, keep the creepy monsters and, and the character arcs, and, and that I can handle. Gotcha. Gotcha. What's your, okay, so if you're into monsters, what's your favorite monster? Do you have a um, favorite? Is that, like asking, is that like asking for a favorite child? <laughs> I'll, I'll divide it in, in, into two answers, because I have favorite that I actually like, and favorite because it scares the absolute hell out of me every time I think about it. Um, and so favorite, um, I, I just love the persistent myth of Bigfoot. Um, it, it's like, I don't know, just something about it is really exciting. There's like the right amount of like anthropological evidence of like, oh, there were many hominins in the past. And it's just enough to be like, well, it'd be really fun to imagine if there were other hominins on Earth besides just humans. Um, so I think just from a pure fun speculative direction, <laughs> that's a fun like uh, legend to, uh, think about. Um, plus I love the idea of like the world today is so explored and we know so much. I love to imagine the, the proverbial dark areas of the map where there's room for stuff to still be found. And with the internet and our, and our vast knowledge that there might be something out there that we just really don't know about. Um, but then if we want to go for monsters that scare the absolute heck out of me, uh, the Wendigo from Native American myth is just terrifying to me. Um, what is that? I don't know that one. <clears throat> it has, um, as with most Native American myths, it comes from various different tribes. So there's various, various interpretations, but the one that seems most common is it is a type of uh, spirit or creature that you can turn into if you uh, consume human flesh. Um, so typically it, a Wendigo story starts with something like uh, pioneers heading west, getting caught in a bad winter. Um, you know, they run out of supplies and they end up cannibalizing someone. Uh, generally, the story goes that they would then turn into a Wendigo, which is a elongated, limbed, um, cannibalistic monster that can mimic the voice of people that it's heard before. Um, and so it'll often lure its victims into the woods by using uh, voices that it's heard or their own voice. Um, and, and depending on how deep you want to go into the mythology of it, it's believed that saying its name, particularly after dark, attracts it to you. Um, 
and obviously I don't believe that much in magic and mythology and whatnot, uh, but just the thought in the back of your head every time of like, hmm, I don't like that saying this thing's name gives it power, and that's very scary to me. Um, and I don't know. I like well, it's, very, it's kind of like the Voldemort thing, right? You can't you can't say its name. You know, you right. have to be super scared of it, right? Yeah. When you you're, when you give you're giving a word like a real terrifying power. You know, you're not allowed to say that word. It makes it really scary, and it gives it way too much power somehow. You know. Absolutely, and it also makes you almost afraid to think it because you're like, "Huh, well, where's the line? Can I think if it?" If I think is it, it, yeah. Is that, is that is that the same? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Okay, I had not heard of that one. So that is, is a terrifying a, creature. If you want to be horrified of it, there's a great uh, video game called Until Dawn. Um, it's a very, it's a horror video game, and it's very popular to have playthroughs of it on YouTube. Um, one of the ways I was introduced to the myth was through a, a couple of comedians playing through Until Dawn, which was the only way, their comedy was the only way that it made it not absolutely terrifying enough so I could actually watch it. Otherwise, I never would have gotten through that game. Oh, uh, well, I've, um, I'm very late to the party, but I've just, I've been finally getting into The Witcher 3 after, you know, very, very late to the party. Um, never really had a chance before. So plenty of monsters in that that I find really interesting. Um... <laughs> So far, like, the botchling's the worst one. That thing was creepy <laughs> as hell. Like, oh my god, you just think... Like, <laughs> a, lot, a lot of them are scary, yeah, and they're big, yeah. And then when they get really, really weird and twisted, that's when it's just, like, makes your skin crawl, thinking about it, like... It's tragic, yeah. right? The whole story yeah. is, like, not just horrifying, it's also sad, and, like, you can almost connect with it on an emotional level. It It's messed up. <laughs> It is messed up, but in a very good way. I mean, I, I'm sad it took me this long to kind of find the time and, inc and inclination to get into the game. But it's 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 great. I mean, I'm loving every second of it. The story, you know, I, I, I still find the combat quite clunky. I think Geralt, at least on the Switch, what I'm playing it on, he moves and has the turning of like a geriatric elephant. Like he just, you know, he's meant to be a witcher and he takes about 10 seconds to turn around properly in the middle of a battle, which isn't, which isn't great. Um, but all, everything about the story, the world, yeah, it's fantastic. It's really, really good. Um, that's interesting. I wonder if that's a Switch thing because I played mine on PC and I, I didn't. Maybe it's it a was console really thing because I, I tried, I tried both Witcher three and two on a, some version of the Xbox a long time ago. My flatmate, it was my flatmate's Xbox, and he so he got the Witcher. This was years back, and he was playing it, and I gave it a shot, and I wasn't hugely into it then but i think i just didn't really have the time then to sort of sit down and, and do it because you know it was his xbox and he wanted to play it and that's fair enough and i was busy trying to write a book and also work my job at the same time so who has time for the witcher <laughs> um but yeah i suspect the switch doesn't make it any smoother put it that way you know it's um, yeah. I'm, I'm i'm surprised it runs as well as it does it hasn't crashed once it hasn't had any issues so it's pretty it's a pretty damn good port yeah. but um yeah Very just, just that just that writing is it's just phenomenal you know oh um, yeah and dare i say i wish some of that had entered into the show but there you go <laughs> yeah yeah it's the witcher is incredible storytelling and anytime we can get more of that i'll take it absolutely yeah get, give me ideas for a future series but uh mm -hmm. I've got a while until i get around to that so um let's not worry there so so been at this for a while, you've done freelancing, you're now doing more like kind of like uh, front facing offering. What so far has been your biggest eye opening experience of publishing of this of this entire gig? Hmm. That's a good question. Um I think it's it's kind of a subtle thing, and I touched on it earlier, but the difference in writing for a client as opposed to writing for yourself. Um, and I think even for a front facing author, the client could be interpreted as what you expect the readers to want or what you expect the publisher to want. And I think that learning to write, kind of listen to my, 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 my unconscious and, and it's, it sounds kind of cheesy, but it's kind of getting in touch with yourself a little bit of like, there's a story that you can, tell yourself. And if you listen closely, you'll hear it. Um, and, and just kind of learning to channel that, that mood of like, 
I'm just going to roll with the story here and see where it goes. I think the difference between that and writing a quick little knock it out book for a client has been the biggest um, realization. Um, because I think, I think that there's not that many books that people, we don't follow authors because they had a cool idea. I mean, obviously it's a part of it, but at the end of the day, the reason readers follow authors is they like the way that, that author tells stories. They like the way that their brain works. And when the author starts writing what they think they, the audience will like, I think they separate themselves for that. Um, so the biggest thing has just been, you know, I guess as cheesy as it sounds like being true to yourself, like don't get bogged down mm -hmm. by outside factors. Just do what feels right to you and chase what excites you for the story. Uh, and at the end of the day, that makes a pretty good book. Yeah. So going with your gut a little bit, right. And, and don't, if you're not enjoying it, then what the heck are you doing? Right. I firmly believe the readers can, can pick up on your enjoyment through the pages. Like if you weren't having fun writing that chapter, the readers will know. And I, it just comes down to like, I mean, even something as technical as like sentence construction can be different because you're like forcing yourself to slog through a chapter instead of like, oh my God, there's so many good ideas here. I have to keep going to keep up with them. I think that that translates into, you know, an intangible excitement that the readers can pick up on. Yeah, no, I think, I, I think so. I mean, it, it's, um, I, I mean, I feel that when you're going, when you're writing and you don't, you're not in love with what, what's happening and sometimes it's fine. Sometimes it's just, you're having a bad day and you come back and actually it's totally fine. Mm -hmm. But sometimes it, you know, you do just have to work it and work it a few times until you kind of find that spark in it that you like. Um, because until you, until, until I like the scenes, almost every scene, it does lack something. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Um, you got, you got to love it. Otherwise, yeah, what are you doing? I mean, it's not, it's no one, no one's forcing you to do this. So you might as well, <laughs> you might as well do something that you like. Right. Right. You know, it, it is a dream job, but it does, it does take a lot of work. And if you wanted to, to weigh out the merits of like stable income and like knowing what your work's going to be, there are a lot of jobs out there that are much more rewarding in those categories than author, but for us maniacs that do it, we valued the the freedom and creativity of it over things like I don't know a regular paycheck, <laughs> just just a little unimportant things like that. <laughs> so, yeah, and you know I you, I often ask this question of people towards the end of the of the interviews, so it's a, and it's sim, it's sort of a similar question, and maybe maybe it's, you're going to say the same thing, so feel free to say the same thing if you want. But I often ask people if they could go back in time and give themselves one piece of advice before say launching that first book or starting that first book, depending on, depending on how it was published. Do you have something that you would like to go back and tell yourself? I think it's don't settle for anything less than exactly what your dream was. Um, Cause I kind of took this journey in steps where in school, uh, I wanted to be an author. I wanted to write books. Um, and I settled for, well, I'll do short stories and send them off. And that's a different conversation. I think short stories are wonderful practice, especially if you're trying to learn to be an author. But I settled instead of saying, I want to write fantasy books. I went, well, I'll write short stories and do a bunch of contests. And that went pretty well. Um, and that kind of gave me the courage to go, well, maybe I will write a book uh, in evenings after work, um, which moved into eventually, well, I'll freelance and I'll do writing for different companies because that's kind of like writing fiction. Then it was like, well, I'll ghostwrite and I'll write other people's books for them. And all of these things were closer to what I actually wanted to do but eventually became intolerable and I had to change out of them because it wasn't my dream. Um, and so I think the advice would simply be settle for nothing less than the dream that you want. Very good advice. But what was it do you think that held you back from just going straight to what you wanted to do? Uh, I think it was just, it's just a big step to like jump out there and, um, and just go for it from, from zero to full force. Um, and if you, and if you want to get it more technical, I think there was, all, it was also a bumpy road into, uh, writing for me. Cause I did, my first novel did get picked up by at the time, the top agent in the U S, um, mm -hmm. was represented for a couple months before they were embroiled in a massive scandal and all of their clients got dropped. And the couple other agents that I had talked to did some digging for me and said, we can't confirm who, what publisher this manuscript was submitted to or not. So essentially no agent is going to touch it because 
they don't want to risk double sending something to a publisher. Um, so my first introduction to writing books for myself was to land what was apparently a great agent only to have them yeah. take my first one true love book and have to start all over from scratch. So that was a bumpy road, <laughs> but yeah, you know, you live and learn, right? Like I, I should have just gone to immediately writing the next book and just, just say, all right, it happened. I've learned. Oh, well, start over, do it again. And we'll make it to work. To be fair, that's pretty bad. To be fair. <laughs> like, that, that usually it's like, oh, I, it got rejected. You know, I'll start the next book. That That's, that's pretty that's pretty gutting which for that, that's a pretty rough one to go through like there's no i don't think there's any uh there's no shame in feeling pretty real um yeah. you know uh knocked knocked by that that's that's a tough one i and think it, i recall what you're talking about now i vaguely remember this mm -hmm. person yeah i think i told it to you and the portal guys in a, in a bit less candid terms um or more candid i'm bad with that word i don't know i think no. i also had a friend that was that uh Got a got a letter back from this particular agent, and this was just before things got kicked off. Oh. But I'd heard some bad things, and I said to her, "Don't you can't give it to this guy. It's just it sounds it sounds super shady, no matter how good it is." And thankfully, she didn't. Um, well, and it's, it's a shame too because another person that got picked up at the same time as me was successfully represented by this person and ended up selling a, a six book fantasy like saga that to this day has done very well. So it was kind of a, it was like a 50-50 if you were going to get the good representation or the lazy representation. Um, but hey, I'm glad that that author did well and it worked out for them. So, And I'm glad you steered your friend away from a, a similar experience to mine. Yeah, well, I'm glad. I mean, um, I, you know, as you say, it could have been a, could have been a coin flip, but um, when, you, when you hear nothing but when you hear slightly dodgy things or things that seem too good to be true, it probably is. Right. Always. There is a, there are people out there that will try to take advantage of your, of your dream, right? As you say, there's plenty of people that are willing to try and jump on that for a little quick, a little quick buck or a turn around or just, just misrepresenting what they can do for you. And, and it's very uh, easy to go along with it when you're kind of willing it to happen. Absolutely. Yeah. It's you, hard you, to keep a level head when it's all kicking off. Yeah, you you it's what you want. So you're yeah. more you're more inclined to accept otherwise red flags, uh, which is why clearly the route is to meet your would be contact at a smoky tavern somewhere <laughs> uh, in central London. <laughs> at a little pub in London, yeah, yeah, that's mm -hmm. that's the places. And so uh, yeah, but that's just you know that's why meeting meeting people is is often the best way to go. And so I think yeah, I, before we started the call, I asked you about Dragon Con. And you are planning to go, is that yeah. right, in September? Yeah, I was, you know, I was supposed to go, 2020 was supposed to be my first year. And obviously, yeah. uh, there were some happen, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, So, yes, I need to, to recommit that promise and, and get down there. I, I'm going to know so many other authors there. It's like, got to go. There's no question. I, I've, I've planned a lot of travel lately, so I'm really burned out on planning travel. Um, mm. But that's an important one. And you're going to be there. Uh, I'm pretty sure Luke's going to be there. Uh, I, the list is long of people. I'm pretty sure Cobble will be there. So, yeah, I have to go see all you people in flesh uh, for the first time for you. And oh, man, I saw Taryn in Boston, but I haven't seen you since London, I don't think. Yeah, probably not. Uh, and, yeah, a lot of a lot of, uh, a lot of other author friends I haven't seen since 2019. And, uh, yeah, it's felt like a long time, though. So uh, it's very, I'm really excited to go, actually. Now that, now that it's booked, now that it's done, I'm kind of wanting to just zip forward to, to September. So you're going to come and uh, try what, to your taste buds, I imagine, will be an abomination. Um, have you had Southern sweet tea before? I have not had the pleasure, but <laughs> <laughs> I will try it. It, was it will probably be way too sweet for me. I, am, I do not have a sweet tooth. Um, I, 100%. I just don't. I've never really had a sweet tooth. I will have a every now and again. I'll have like a little something, but like a, a full blown sweet drink. I think I, I tried if I try to drink Coke now, like cola, I can't do it. It's like it's like drinking maple syrup or something. I just can't. It's too much. Sure. Um, but yeah, I, I I look forward to trying these sweet teas and <laughs> um and whatever else. Get some classic pancakes or something. I don't know what you guys will give me. Gris. <laughs> As well, we, what other horrible things can they try? That'll be that'll be fun. I, I'm from Florida, which isn't truly like the South, 
but I've yeah. spent enough time around the South that uh, I will gladly volunteer to introduce you to all the traditional foods and we'll probably take a couple of years off your life uh, <laughs> through all of these tastings. I mean, the the flights will probably take another year off my off my life, so it'll be a <laughs> it's it'll a be a <laughs> Yeah. Well, uh, maybe on that note, Alex, we'll leave it there until September. But it was yeah. great uh, catching up. Uh, I really look forward to seeing you in person for the first time in forever. Yeah. And uh, we can we can see how Paragon Two is coming along, and uh, hopefully, I'm a little further forward with this this third book as well. And uh, Look forward to hanging out then. And thanks for coming and chatting to me tonight. It's been great. Oh, no, absolute pleasure. Thanks for having me. It's always it's always fun talking through, you know, WhatsApp and whatever is one thing. But, like, if it's not Zoom or a, you know, a pub in central London, it just doesn't just doesn't add up. Exactly. exactly. So and before yeah. we go, would you like to tell everyone where they can find you and, and your books online? Sure. Yeah, that's probably – I'm bad at promotion, so that's probably something I should do. Um, yeah, you, the best place is just author, Alex Um, you can find all my stuff there. It'll, it'll link out to my social medias and all my books and whatnot. Um, so yeah, catch me there. Um, otherwise I'm, I'm most active on, on Twitter, I suppose. Um, and I think it's, I'm not even going to attempt my, my, my handle cause it's just on the website. You can find it there. Um, but yeah, no, come, come, come chat, check out the books, ask me questions, whatever. I'm always down. Uh, my favorite part of this industry is just like, talking to readers. It's absolutely awesome to think, wow, I thought up this wild, ridiculous idea. Somebody decided it was okay to print it. And now this person read it and loved it. Um, that's a wild experience. So uh, I look forward to, to chatting with all of you. And uh, if anybody's going to be at Dragon Con, uh, come catch Michael and I and whoever else is in the entourage. <laughs> the entourage. <laughs> <laughs> we, we wish maybe one day, maybe one day. <laughs> Well, see, we tag along with Luke and pretend that we're as relevant as him. That's that's how it goes. We'll be in their entourage. <laughs> we are the uh, the twin blades uh, that accompany Luke on either shoulder. Oh yeah, yeah. We'll work on finishing some other sentences for that. Get matching outfits. Be good. Really? Yeah. All right, man. Well, it's, uh, it was great chatting to you, and I'll see you soon. Bye, fam. Have a good one.